The chlor alkali industry is one of huge importance to the world. Estimated to have a net worth of over $80 billion, it accounts for a large sector of the global economy. But like all major industries, it is one not short of controversy. Now, you may be wondering why I am clad in such formal clothing. That I do not know. But what I can say is this pool behind me would not be as pristine as it is had it not been for one of the most essential industries in the world. <laughs> The chloralkali industry involves the production of chlorine and other products through the electrolysis of brine. The first time it was commercialized was in 1888, and today more than 95% of the world chlorine production is achieved through this process. You may be asking yourself why anyone would want to electrolyze salty water. The answer lies in the value of the substances we get from it. But before we can get to know these products, we must first find out more about salt itself. Well, the word salt is a chemical term that is used to describe the ionic compound formed when an acid reacts with the base. It is found on every single continent in the world. And since its discovery in the Neolithic ages, it has been valued for preservation and seasoning properties. We switch to Old Spice. At one stage in history, salt had an equal value to gold per ounce. It has also played other major roles throughout history, including the French Revolution, um, the formation of the Erie Canal. It also helped India become independent from British control. Salt is key in the thyroid process and therefore key in our diets. Doctors warn of high blood pressure when too much salt is consumed in our diets in many fast foods. In production, salt has been used to obtain solid sodium metal as well as chlorine gas through the process of electrolysis. Now at this stage I can understand if you are all like, what is this? But let us take a deeper look at the electrolysis process itself. For an electrolysis reaction to take place, an electrolyte, a power supply that supplies direct current, and two electrodes, namely an anode and a cathode, are required. The chloralkali process is the process by which salt is electrolyzed to create products. Electrolysis is a decomposition reaction, meaning that electric current flows through a solution which contains ions to create products. Electrolysis is a redox reaction, meaning that it contains a reduction half reaction and an oxidation half reaction. In the chloralkali process, sodium chloride, or brine, which essentially is salty water, is electrolyzed to create products. This is the main process used throughout the chloralkali industry. In the chloralkali process, three different methods are used, namely the membrane cell, the diaphragm cell, and mercury cell. While each of these cells contain different reactions, each of them produce the same overall product. In the diaphragm cell, uh, originally a percolating, which is a filtering, uh, asbestos diaphragm was used. Now asbestos being with very tiny fibers, if you breathe it in, it could lead to lung cancer and other diseases. And the asbestos it allows other substances through it. So because of this, the, the quality of the chlorine is not very good. And the caustic soda that is produced is, is dilute and impure. Now the membrane cell differs from the diaphragm cell in the material that is used as the semi-permeable division, meaning that it affects which substances can be allowed through. The membrane specifically only allows cations, which are cations are positively charged ions, and thus only the sodium cations are allowed through. You do not get uh, sodium chloride contaminating the caustic soda. And because of this, the, the caustic soda produced by the, the membrane cell is of much higher quality than that of the diaphragm cell. So unlike the diaphragm and the membrane cell, the mercury cell does not produce caustic soda and hydrogen at the, at the cathode. Instead, the sodium cations mix with the, the mercury, creating an amalgam, which is basically 
the name given to anything dissolved in mercury. This amalgam then travels to a separate reactor called a, a decomposer and in the presence of a catalyst it reacts with water and gives off the, the products. Now the caustic soda produced by the mercury cell has actually got the very similar levels of purity uh, with the caustic soda from the membrane cell. This means that it has very little salt contamination. The caustic soda produced by the mercury cell is of a much higher concentration than that of the membrane cell, meaning it is therefore of better quality. On the other hand, the, the mercury cell uses much more electricity than the other two. Furthermore, if the, the concentrations of the various substances are not maintained, it could lead to very high hydrogen concentrations which then you run the risk of a hydrogen chlorine explosion. Mix that with mercury and it's not a very good scenario. This is still in addition to the fact that mercury is of course a highly toxic substance. If all the specifications are thus considered, it is quite obvious that one cell stands out. Overall being the cheaper and the safer cell as well as having very high quality products, there is no question that the membrane cell is just the best of all three and thus the best choice for the electrolysis of brine. Now that we have confirmed that the membrane cell is indeed the optimum cell for us, let us find out just exactly how it works. The process is explained in this diagram. In the membrane cell, the two electrodes are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Brine, which is sodium chloride or NaCl solution, is pumped into the anode half cell as an electrolyte. The chloride ions within the brine, which are negatively charged, are oxidized at the anode. This converts them into neutral chlorine atoms that bond together and bubble off before being collected as chlorine gas. The membrane only allows the positively charged sodium ions through to the cathode half cell. At this electrode, water is reduced to hydrogen gas, leaving hydroxide ions with the sodium ions that came through the membrane, forming sodium hydroxide, better known as caustic soda. Thus, just through the electrolysis of simple brine, we have produced three essential products, chlorine gas, hydrogen gas, and caustic soda. Cheese and crackers. Cheese and crackers indeed. Now that we know how to obtain them, it's time to find out about each of these substances in depth. Humans have been using chlorine for thousands of years as a salt. Carl Scheele first stumbled upon chlorine in 1774 while studying the mineral pyrolusite. When pyrolusite is mixed with hydrochloric acid, it produces a heavy gas with a powerful odor. Originally named defoxylated marine acid, it was later changed to chlorine, which is derived from the Greek word chloris, meaning pale green. There are seven known radioactive isotopes of chlorine. They have been very useful in studying into the effects of seawater on metals. Chlorine-36 is commonly used to recreate marine conditions. The most useful thing to come out of chlorine has been polyvinyl chloride. The developer, Eugen Baumann, received many awards for his work leading to its discovery. The chlorine bombs and mustard gas that were used in World War I were labelled inhumane. But all in all, chlorine has done more good than bad. Caustic soda, also known as uh, sodium hydroxide, is used in the process of manufacturing many different products. Um, this is because it is a strong base, so strong that it is um, corrosive and therefore harmful to humans, but also because it is inexpensive. The use of caustic soda dates back to ancient Egypt, where coarse soaps were first manufactured using lime and uh, sodium carbonate. The uses of caustic soda include the production of bleach, textiles, cleaning agents, um, and caustic soda is also used in the manufacturing process of soaps. Consisting of about 90% neat soap mass and about 10% moisture, soap is a wax-like substance that increases water's ability to wash away greases and oils from dishes, from clothes, and from our bodies. In history, Animal fats and oils are added to an alkali to synthesize soap from as early as 600 BC. It was seen as a luxury to have soap in those days. Soaps are used obviously as a cleansing agent, as a mild antiseptic, and interestingly enough as an ingestible antidote for certain types of poisonings. Rupert Boyle first discovered hydrogen in 1671. 
The credit, however, goes to Henry Cavendish, who defined hydrogen. Hydrogen, being lighter than air, has contributed hugely to air travel. Due to the simple atomic structure of hydrogen, it has created the backbone of the atomic theory. Hydrogen has, is highly explosive and soon used to create the hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen has been a, a key element in organic chemistry. Hydrogen attaches itself to carbon chains. The carbon chains are refined with using the process of cracking to get petrol and gas. Fertilizers are based on hydrogen. They help crops grow and have a huge effect on the soil and the economy. In the future, hydrogen could be used as a possible renewable energy source. This means it could be key to a brighter future. In fact, all of these products have many, many uses and benefit our lives far more than one might suspect. Well, you know, every time you open the tap and fill up a glass of water like this, remember, it's the chloracolor industry that you should thank for making it drinkable. This is one of the many ways this essential industry helps you in everyday life. Likewise, nylon seat belts as well as airbags also contain ingredients produced in the chloralkali industry. And I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that these two items unquestionably improve safety on the road. Chloralkali cells produce caustic soda which is used in the, as an important ingredient in the food industry. Some delicacies such as the Norwegian lutefisk use it in their production. Others such as um, German pretzel, they use cold sodium hydroxide and they poach the pretzels in it to produce the iconic crust that so distinctifies the German pretzel. Interestingly enough, caustic soda is also used in the formation of yellow Chinese noodles. Even with all the wonderful benefits that the products of the chloralkali industry have to offer, we cannot overlook the dangers that these substances can pose. In the 50s, laundry detergents which are made using caustic soda contained phosphorus which later contaminated rivers and lakes creating breeding grounds for abnormally large algae that stole oxygen in the water from the local plant life in turn destroying entire ecosystems. Luckily today, most detergents are phosphate free because of this. Another major environmental risk involved with chloralkali cells, and more specifically, the mercury cell, is the fact that mercury is involved in the process. This exact risk proved fatal in Minamata, Japan, where mercury entered the Shiranu Sea, which then infected the local fishing village's food chain. It proved disastrous as over 1,500 people died of what is now called Minamata disease. This incident caused a ban on all mercury processes in Japan in 1984, but a worrying factor is that the mercury process still exists in many countries today. It is important at this moment in time to recall the wonder of this process. Through the utilization of this membrane cell, we, as humans, are able to turn such a simple and abundant resource as brine into a hugely valuable commodity that affects our lives hugely for the better. Now that is real beauty. Thus, at the end of our journey, we cannot conclude that the chloralkali industry is all good. Rather good, but dangerous. Yet one must remember that not all chlorine bombs are bad. Was that really funny? Does that look really funny, Paul? <laughs>